Hello and welcome to the latest seminar from the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, supporting new approaches to improve health and tackle inequality. In this videocast, Gary Belkin, founder and president of Billion Minds Institute and visiting scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, delivers this keynote presentation addressing the social crisis within the climate crisis. It was recorded via Zoom on the 10th of November 2021. Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to you, Gary, joining us from New York, uh, from the States, and at, the, at least, I'm sure. Uh, and very warm, warm welcome from everyone here in uh, the UK and elsewhere who are joining us for this Glasgow Population Health Centre, uh, sorry, Glasgow Centre for Population Health Seminar. My name is Jean Neto, and I have been invited to chair this seminar, this very important and timely centre, on behalf of the Glasgow Centre for Population Health, I am a reader at Heriot Watt University uh, in international and forced migration, and it, I'm delighted to be able to 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 uh, to host this seminar. I was formerly a mental health uh, commissioner with the Mental Welfare Commission in Scotland, and I continue to have a long-standing interest in research and policy issues relating to mental health, and particularly from an equalities perspective. So before I introduce Gary, um, I'll just briefly run through the seminar for this afternoon. Gary will speak for about 45 minutes, after which we will have a brief Q&A discussion with a small panel. Due to the high number of attendees today, we have disabled the Q&A and chat functions. Thank you to all of you who have submitted questions in advance, which we will do our best to cover during this discussion. If you would like to briefly tweet during and after the seminar, please use the hashtag GCPH, uh, hashtag GCPHSEM18. A recording of the webinar, along with the presentation slides, will be available on the GCPH website in the next couple of weeks. All attendees will also be sent a link to this when available. So on behalf of Glasgow Centre of Population Health, we are delighted to have Gary here today to talk about two of the biggest public health challenges of our time, climate change and population mental health. Gary joins us from New York, where he is founder and president of the Billion Minds Institute and visiting scientist at the Harvard School of Public Health. Gary has a background in psychiatry and has held a range of both health and city government roles within New York. He has worked globally to test and scale community-led models of mental health promotion and access in less resourced countries. He has worked globally to test and scale community-led uh, models of mental health promotion and access. And he is currently leading, uh, sorry, he previously led the Public Mental Health Initiative Thrive New York City, and most recently founded Billion Minds as a nonprofit policy and think action tank, tank, focusing on linking mental health to problems of great scale, specifically to climate change. Gary, it's my pleasure to hand over to you, and I look forward very much to hearing your presentation. Gary, you're on mute. I just am now. on mute. I'm always on mute. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Gina, um, and also Carol and Jenny again for your help in facilitating all this. Thanks everyone for showing, who's on this, showing interest um, in this issue and these connections uh, that I hope to draw and encourage us all to draw um, more substantively between mental health, social health, and the tasks of living um, on an earth in the midst of this environmental and climate change. Um, I also want to shout out to Michael Smith, who um, I missed not being in Glasgow in person to see again. Um, he embodies that rare combination of mental health, population mental health expertise and social health expertise and how you bridge them. Um, and we need more uh, folks like him. And thanks for connecting me to this, um, to the center and this uh, seminar. Um, so roughly, I'm gonna grab uh, the screen here. Uh, so, um, so 
I think we're not talking enough about the social side of climate change. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is that if we're going to do the work on the left, um, that is rebalance uh, the earth climate in a, a virtual, a virtuous a cycle of regenerative ecologies, you know, gas emission balance, et cetera, uh, and biodiversity, um, entanglements of, of life that are kept um, that are kept uh, in place by and help keep the regenerative cycles of, uh, of an ecology of life. Um, if we're going to accomplish that, um, uh, we have to also worry about our what I've been calling the social climate, our own virtuous cycle of um, uh, well-being, balanced well-being, stable, subjective well-being, um, and also um, the webs of diverse action and interaction um, among us in terms of the collective efficacy uh, to do a lot of the work of um, that uh, sustainability demands. If we, we are not going to be able to be stewards of a regenerative, mutually interdependent earth if we are not a regenerative, mutually interdependent people. Um, if, we, if our social climate um, does not um, uh, nurture, that, then we, we can't um, re-nurture the planet. And so um, that is uh, an aspect of things that is not poetic, I, although, although it may be, um, but I, I find it to be very pragmatic and practical and necessary to get serious and tangible about how we grow and get really good at um, sustaining the, that sort of social climate that um, sustains um, the connection between well-being and action. Um, so the, there is a, a, a growing, um, I wouldn't say that it is a um, clearly distinct body of research and work and policy thinking about how we mobilize civic action and collective action, how we do that well. Um, how we bring conditions of society to be nurturing so that we can nurture. Um, and uh, these uh, titles are sort of examples of fields of work that, um, um, uh, you know, these are just examples of, of actually a lot of, of, of thinking about this, but still uh, not surfacing in terms of really hard step policy attention and action to invest in and um, secure this strong social climate um, that we need. But I think that there are um, lessons and models and interdisciplinary um, traditions um, and institutions within the public health world, particularly working on population health and especially working on population mental health that I think do have a lot to contribute um, to more uh, building out this social climate project. Um, I noticed on you guys' website, uh, um, these um, key areas of, of work. Um, and I find uh, that there's a lot of overlap in, in these ways of thinking um, that really start to aim at synthesizing these connections between the social and the health or the mental health uh, that serve larger social purposes. And so I feel at home talking here and glad to have this platform and a community of interest in thinking in these, in these um, uh, new sorts of ways. How we project what we know um, in worrying about the social health dimensions to the purpose of getting the population ready to tackle the challenges of, of climate and environmental change. And I'm focusing here on um, where population mental health can um, contribute to that and has a lot to say to that. Um, the thing, though, is, and I'll be very honest, I'm a psychiatrist, I love being a psychiatrist, um, but our field, the mental health field, has been lagging in um, really grappling with the social dimensions of uh, mental health, um, and not just the social dimensions of mental health in terms of the social determinants that, that impact health and illness and suffering, but, but the necessity of mental strengths, of socio-emotional strengths and assets um, to successful societies, particularly to resilient, socially resilient societies in the face of climate and environmental change. 
And so we have a lot to do in the mental health field to realize that potential by first acknowledging that we are behind in thinking about mental health at a population level. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that first and sort of my journey about how to um, address that in, in, in policy and more concretely in building new systems to make population mental health a real tangible, actionable force. Um, and there are two sorts of things uh, that I thought we have to grapple with. One is, and this diagram is data from the Global Burden Disease Study, the, the most recent one that just shows the relative contribution of different diseases to disability in the population. Um, so each color is a different category of, of illnesses, musculoskeletal disorders, cardiac disorders, cancer, et cetera. And over the lifespan from left to right, the relative contribution they have to disability in the population, the inability to do things, social roles, to work, et cetera. Um, and the take home is that, uh, is the red, are, is mental health and substance use. And it has an outsized impact on social outcomes, on social life, on living, on quality of life, um, on, on um, uh, functional capacity. Um, and we don't remotely act like we know that in terms of how we do and uh, uh, how we do mental health policy, at least in the, in the US we don't. I think this is slowly changing more in Europe around in ways that I'll talk about in terms of uh, putting well being more in the center of uh, policy, larger social policy discourse. Um, but um, certainly in my world, uh, we, we don't really do mental health in a way that uh, is worried about shrinking the red. And another thing that we, we are behind doing is thinking about um, uh, not just the social determinants of mental health um, beyond, you know, which are the larger category of, of explanatory, uh, of, of explaining mental illness, our social variables, um, not biological ones, um, but also the degree that those social uh, determinants um, you know, income, poverty, uh, race, or really racism, um, uh, and so forth, are distributed geographically very selectively and, and, and reflect um, a whole range of uh, intentional and structural decisions to segregate and discriminate. Um, and so we have maps like this in New York City, and, um, and we, we can find these maps everywhere. Uh, the top left um, going clockwise is, um, psychiatric hospitalization rates. Then if you go to the right, lifetime depression rates, bottom right is um, people who are incarcerated uh, in these neighborhoods rates. And then left, the lower left is life expectancy. Um, in each of these maps, the, the darker shading is, is the worst uh, um, gradient. And you can see that all that, that these uh, um, maps tend to, tend to get dark in the same um, uh, neighborhoods, in the same geographies. Uh, and so in life expectancy, you can have, you can have neighboring, neighboring zip codes um, uh, in, or community districts, I'm sorry, in, in New York City, uh, where uh, life expectancy differs by 10 years. Um, and, um, but so does lifetime depression, risk of psychiatric hospitalization um, and so forth. And so our mental health system is just not, um, and how we train, how we think, our science, how we fund things, everything is not, really meant to solve those problems. Um, and uh, so I uh, started my own path of thinking about, okay, how do we get upstream? How do we, how do we um, uh, redistribute our work to really be place-based and population impactful um, and not just at the illness end, but at the suffering end. Um, and so I learned a lot by working in Global South. I, I worked in um, this top left is uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, after the earthquake in 2010. I worked with a group called Partners in Health. Lower left, I worked in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa with um, the Millennium and Villages Project. What really intrigued me about these places was they were doing health, how they were doing health, uh, by skilling community members to do a chunk, if not the bulk, of the work. Um, and so I and others at the time were starting to think, okay, you know, we should be, we could do that with mental health, can't we? And so this chart you see, which you probably can't read very well, but actually the graphics capture the point, which is um, we took a World Health Organization clinical pathway for depression, for the treatment of depression. And everything on the left-hand column, the vertical column are very tangible tasks that one would have to do to execute that clinical 
pathway. Um, that uh, you uh, use a screening instrument, you educate um, the patient, um, you do a mental status exam, you ask about side effects of medication <clears throat> and so forth. So it's a very tangible task. And then we looked at who we had in the community and this is in rural <clears throat> um, um, Haiti, in the Eastern part of Haiti. Um, and we have, you know, you have, have community leaders, <clears throat> community mental health workers, social workers, um, uh, we had, we eventually also involved clergy and teachers and so forth. You have some physicians and we filled in who could do what, and we could fill out the whole grid. So with whom we had, we could do the tasks. We could knit together the tasks for, uh, evidence-based care for depression. And that's what we did. And, and actually there grew a field called task sharing, um, uh, within mental health that is now a very rich and deep evidence base. Um, this upper right, if you're looking for a single reference, and I believe the PDF of this um, will be available to, to you all. Uh, the, the upper right um, is a really good synthesis of, the, of this field, and it's now a really rich, deep evidence base um, that this kind of task sharing, this kind of skilling others, lay people, residents, neighbors, uh, and a lot of the tasks of, scare, of, of care can really work. And when I was deputy health commissioner in New York City, I got to really try this out at scale in New York. Uh, one of the things we imported was called friendship benches, which is, which is just such a quintessentially uh, exemplary idea of this notion of task sharing, where in Zimbabwe, uh, they train mostly grandmothers and benches outside of primary care clinics um, in, primary, in uh, problem solving therapy, which is an evidence-based therapy for depression. Uh, they would meet with moms who were thought to maybe benefit from this from the clinics, and they did their thing. We in New York, this is our version of uh, the uh, friendship bench, we did in a more pop-up version. We literally placed these, as you can see, in corners of neighborhoods who were either underserved in terms of mental health services, who there was a traumatic event in the in the in, in, in the neighborhood, uh, suicide in a housing um, a project, in a, 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 a shooting that traumatized the neighborhood and shook the neighborhood, or just a high need area. And we would just pop this up. People would come. They would often get escorted to services. They would be counseled right in the moment. Um, it's quite a, a um, different way of thinking about uh, the real estate, the, the, the kind of geography, the, the distribution, the spatialization of the work of mental health. Um, and here's just some data, just so you know, I'm not making this stuff up of some of these things. Uh, here's some friendship bench um, data. This is versus usual care, PHQ-9 scores, which is a very common uh, tool for measuring depression. Um, uh, you could see, you know, market decreases in um, uh, and highly, highly significant decreases compared to usual care in, in um, also having the bench um, as a resource, something called the Healthy Activity Program in India, which was a similar kind of brief intervention that could be done by, by lay people. And this is for pretty severe depression. Um, for people who are, who are familiar with these scales, like the BDI, these, this is a pretty... Um, um, uh, these folks started with, with pretty hefty levels of depression with clearly significant, greater significant improvement in those who had the lay counseling uh, versus those who didn't. Um, and uh, you can take this whole community army approach um, to more upstream population impact rather than just waiting for sick people to come and benefit from this. Uh, and that was the logic behind this, this uh, bottom left uh, an initiative called Vishram, also in India, um, uh, led uh, as did the, the HAP by Vikram Patel, who really was a, was a mover and shaker and leader in this whole area of task sharing, um, where what they did was they uh, just did education in the community about depression. Um, and they found, and, and then they uh, screened uh, population randomly and found cases of untreated depression and referred them to care. And what they found was the, um, uh, they also asked people who had depression if they, if they sought care for it, um, if they were connected to care. And uh, what they found was by deploying these community health workers to not just do work with already identified sick people, but to also enhance the literacy and awareness in the community is that degree of un met care, what they call the contact rate, people who had depression who found care also went up. So it sort of sensitized the community um, uh, uh, in a way that uh, resulted in actual increased coverage uh, of care in the population. So it was a population approach that also uh, closed a, a treatment gap, um, all through using civic muscle 
citizens, neighbors to do, to do the work. So I created this thing when I was a deputy health commissioner at City called Thrive NYC, where we put this idea of task sharing or respatializing the work uh, to, to, to task in a, in, a, um, in a global north setting, New York City, 9 million people. Um, and I show you this, this map, um, each dot represents, there are like 54 initiatives where we put skills and work in many other places um, outside of mental health clubs. And each dot is such a <clears throat> location where, where activity and these initiatives are going on. The different colors just cover, reflect different populations that were a focus, whether it was youth or it was pregnant moms or people with substance use. Um, the point, the more important point that of this illustration is, uh, is you can capture the sense of really changing the real estate um, for where mental health work um, um, can happen. Uh, and so each of these dots is not a, an abstract dot, it's actually a geocoded location where, where this work was going on. And so you're seeing now, you know, uh, job training programs and daycare centers and schools um, and um, uh, shelters for, for victims of um, inter, in their, uh, intimate partner violence and uh, just a whole array of places uh, that were now um, mental health places, promoting places. Um, and what working that way also did was because a lot of these places were aligned with other city government missions and purposes and agencies, is this brought a lot of city agencies uh, to be involved in this work as well. So it operationally functioned to go upstream, to get geographical reach, um, particularly in these more high hit uh, places that you saw on the maps, those most socially determinatively burdened places. And it brought an intersectoral involvement, a cross-sectoral involvement um, to the issue so that, that the way mental health impacted the work of the police department, of the Department of Education, of the Department of Youth and Community Development, Department of Aging, uh, as represented in these agency logos here, um, those agencies now started to be co-owners and really incorporated uh, what we knew about what mental health stuff could do to what they needed to do in their, their other missions. And, um, and it became a, a really um, um, exciting uh, uh, way to operationalize and get closer to not just thinking about the links of the social uh, and the emotional and mental health morbidity, but to really operationalize how, um, how to reach it. And to each of these dots, we could skill people to do direct um, work with people in acute distress or to do more mental health promotion, preventive upstream kind of work, like coaching pro-attachment skills in new moms uh, in uh, certain neighborhoods uh, through peer mom coaching uh, methods, all evidence-based sort of practices. So um, uh, those things are often siloed. We often silo prevention and promotion work from care um, because of the institutional breakdowns and business models and politics and culture, but this really, not only respatialize the work, it, it, it kind of broke through those, um, you know, those, uh, those barriers. And um, so what does this have to do with um, climate change? Well, um, when I, um, the, the short answer is, uh, and I'll go through this a little more methodically, uh, COVID has uh, in the US given us, uh, I think the last national data showed almost half of the population of the adult population ruling in for a, uh, particularly among, among younger adults, um, 40 to 50% ruling in for a diagnosable um, uh, anxiety or depressive disorder. That is, that is just stunning. Um, uh, so the, 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 the mental health shock to the population has been, has been great. Um, the pressures of climate, um, I mean, COVID is gonna, I sadly predict COVID is gonna be a walk in the park in terms of the social and emotional hit um, and trauma uh, than COVID has. We need a mental health strategy that can look like this map, that can be everywhere and uh, is um, democratized in terms of knowledge and actors and owners and um, uh, diffused in terms of uh, where it works. And so I, I actually left city government um, because I was personally very moved by um, 
uh, the challenges of climate change. If I wasn't working on climate change, I felt like I was wasting my time a little bit. And in trying to think of, okay, what can I contribute? I was thinking, well, this is one starting point. This is starting to really think about how we don't just talk about the social and emotional resilience we need in the face of disasters and escalating um, adversities and environmental pressures, but we can actually build it. Um, and this started me on thinking even more and more about that. Um, uh, but one thing I've been starting to do is to think is, okay, we did this map in New York City. We had a lot of funding. We had a lot of political will. I learned the hard way that political will is fragile. Um, and that an outside of the mainstream kind of idea of this, of the kind of hardwiring of mental health care, which is much more clinician and clinic based, that's where uh, the funding works, that's what the politics is around, um, that this kind of community strategy um, needs more friends and more stability and more infrastructure. Um, and so what I started doing, uh, as I kind of associated with it as a needed way to meet the population health needs uh, affecting, you know, facing climate change, which I'm going to go into a bit more, I started, one of the first things I started thinking about and helped me pivot from the work I was doing uh, was, okay, how can we build infrastructure to scale this kind of map? Um, but I've been starting to ask that question with climate friends, climate dots environmental justice organizations, local grassroots um, climate organizations. Um, how do we use networks of those kind of groups and civic muscle on the ground to also um, be able to do the socio-emotional uh, work? And you're seeing some of the organizations that I'm starting to think that through with, and I think we can, we can um, build those networks and fuel uh, those um, uh, kind of strategies. But, um, before I uh, uh, go further in terms of the things we can do and we need to do in reimagining our mental health system is to step back again um, and, and talk about, okay, what are the, what are, what's the mental health hit from climate change? And not just what's the mental health hit, but what I was saying before, what mental health and social strengths have to be brought to this work of um, tackling uh, climate change and um, being ready for the demands on human life of environmental um, collapse. Uh, and so, um, and that, that's a, the first thing um, has gotten more of the attention when people say mental health and climate change, including the mental health field. And it's really about sort of, okay, what are some of the direct morbidity, illness, you know, care, um, uh, consequences for, for individuals, which is what the mental health field mostly, mostly thinks about. And um, I'm going to start in thinking and walking through what some of those things are, but then I'm going to take it to higher level order levels that the mental health field has to think about anyway, but has to especially think about in the, in the context of the pressures of climate change, which is what are not just the mental health impact and demand on needs for individuals, but for communities, for the survivability of communities, not just because they're flooded, but because they, because we want them to socially function. And what um, about our um, larger social norms? Um, and there especially, it's not just the way climate might do damage um, and corrode uh, some of our social glue and social norms, um, but again, here, I think there's a real untapped opportunity for the mental health, public health uh, communities to contribute to shifting um, some deep norms that need to be shifted. If we're going to get to that circle I showed you of, of a robust social climate that can tackle the Earth's climate. Well, let's start with the individual uh, more direct illness and um, morbidity burdens of climate change. Um, and so... Clearly, you know, and what has there's been a fair bit of research to build on is um, adverse weather events, particularly storms, hurricanes, etc. We know a lot about um, how these adverse weather events um, um, escalate levels of depression, trauma, substance use, and so forth. Um, this is one of the longer longitudinal follow-ups. Uh, this is after Hurricane Katrina in the U.S. I think folks were followed for 12 years. What I want to show here, here are different measures of at the bottom line is of um, 
psychological distress. No, sorry. The bottom line is uh, serious mental illness. Um, the middle dotted line is uh, levels of um, uh, scored uh, psychological distress, which is the, really the general health questionnaire scores. Um, and these are high scores, as you can see. And then the top is uh, um, post-traumatic stress symptoms um, is a solid line. And so you see this pattern, this cohort of folks were studied. What makes it so interesting is this is a group of um, new mothers in poverty who are in community colleges in mostly the Louisiana area and the Orleans area um, uh, in a study to see uh, interventions that help them stay in college. Um, and that was started before Katrina. Then Katrina hit. And so they kept following this cohort. They had this baseline data of, of an adversity facing population. Um, and so they were able to follow them over this time. And you could see after Katrina, these escalated rates of, of all, the, all of these things, and almost doubling of serious mental illness, a 50% increase in um, psychological distress and so forth. But what's really important here is in terms of um, um, uh, PD and SMI, um, the long tail of these things. And um, this is a really great study to look at, very thoughtful, but also looks at the whole idea of the social network dispersion, because many folks left. So they compare people who stay, people who left. Um, it's a fascinating study of, of the many nuanced ways that not just social support, but social networks and reliance on place-based social networks um, also affects the course of, of these curves. But we know that if the trauma hit is hard after events, heat has been studied, um, I won't go through in detail the, the, all that mess of data on the left, but basically this is from a meta-analysis that shows different risk factors for death in a heat wave. And um, the, uh, the, the, the greatest comorbid uh, uh, factor is uh, having a mental illness. Um, and that's partly true to taking psychotropic uh, medications being its own independent risk factor, but, but um, controlling for that mental illness um, uh, is um, a greater risk factor for uh, death in, in heat. Um, and there's was this very intriguing data on the lower right that came out of work, county level work, looking at temperature changes by county in the US and Mexico with suicide rates by county um, over a long period of time that showed a real linear relationship between increased heat um, and suicide. Um, and we can expect to see on the left, um, uh, we're in the midst of a rapid rise in the U.S. of projected um, uh, uh, average temperatures. Uh, Europe, in terms of where we are on the global warming uh, pathway, on emissions pathway, we are not on where we should be, as I'm sure you've been reading and hearing. Um, national pledges, COPPA's advertising are not keeping us on course for the declines we need. So we're probably more in, you know, in between these two diagram uh, heat uh, projections. And so particularly Northern and Eastern Europe um, are probably in four, but, uh, uh, but Scotland is in, in the sort of two plus ish degree change to expect by mid century, a degree Celsius average change. Southern Europe also um, not only expecting uh, more heat, but but uh, more drought. Um, and these individual effects are amplified, right? So you have something Katrina with this traumatic suffering, that's a whole population that's traumatically suffering. You have heat like this, uh, you have drought, food instability, et cetera. You have migration, uh, mass migration. Um, the whole notion of climate refugees is growing, UNHCR. Um, estimates this year approximately 20, 30 million um, refugees, climate associated refugees, that, ex that number we expect to increase perhaps by an order of magnitude or more um, with current trends. Um, so these individual effects, just think of them in terms of morbidity um, are, are massively multiplied. Um, and uh, what we're finding in the US, there was recent reporting, you know, wildfires and flooding and super, and super storms of people who like leave the Gulf Coast and move to California. You know, one year they're fleeing, you know, hurricane devastation, another, another they're uh, addressing wildfire issues. The, the, the chronicity, the inescapability 
uh, of these issues is going to even multiply that kind of morbidity further. We do not have a mental health system. Our current model of doing mental health is just incapable of meeting that illness and morbidity burden. But there's more uh, emotional burden uh, that, that we need to uh, be ready for. Uh, which is um, what this uh, uh, opinion piece in the Washington Post talked about, you know, the, the, these, these anticipatory anxieties, existential dread, as uh, this piece put it, um, the, and the chronicity of, of, of these conditions. It's not episodic. You can't try to rebuild and recover and then, and then move on. It's the chronicity of it. The, 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 the piece here was really addressing that in, in terms of the wildfire and the wildfires in the, in the Western US. Um, and, and, you know, there's a lot of discussion in the, in, the, in the public media about climate anxiety, eco-anxiety, it's called a lot of things, but is really this kind of a fear of all these things happening, not just being in the brunt of them. Um, they are perceptions or the change perceptions of confidence in having a future. Um, these real mix of, of existential anxieties, which sound, make them sound somewhat academic and esoteric, but increasingly data is showing is there, there can be quite impairing and are very common and increasingly common. Um, this is a, is a, a but, but we still are not measuring them as effectively and sophisticatedly as we should. This is polling data from the US on the left. Um, the majority of Americans flipped finally in 2019 flipped to have the majority rating that they were either alarmed or concerned about climate. Um, uh, up until then it was flipped the other way. Uh, most were, there was more heavy, heavy pulling of doubtful and dismissive and alarmed and concerned. So real shifting in the general population. We're starting to get better measures. This is work by Susan Clayton on um, a, a measure of climate anxiety change, which my takeaway was it shows that there's, a, there's, there, there's not just a, a real prevalence of it, but, but there's real uh, impairment interfering with sort of daily activities, the ability to concentrate, sleep, enjoy activities, which are sort of the hallmarks of when we start worrying clinically about things like depression. Um, the HOG scale um, did some sophisticated psychometric work that um, did show that it was capturing something very climate specific. And this was a very distinct kind of anxiety and fear and, um, and vulnerability then uh, um, similar potential kinds of symptom readings that might overlap with things like depression, that this is the clinical depression is, as we have otherwise defined it. Um, this, is, this is a unique thing and it's an impairing thing. And it is especially um, affecting youth um, and, in high numbers. Uh, there was recently a, a global study, 10,000 youth by the Eco Anxiety and Climate Emergency Research Group. Um, which not only found high levels of reported um, fear of the future, lack of confidence in the future, a whole range of, 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 of highly rated emotions from despair, to anxiety and worry and so forth. But what really came out from this study was a sense of being betrayed, um, a sense from youth that um, government is really not on their side, they, it can't be trusted, it's not gonna deliver. Um, and I think this, this issue of, of an intergenerational um, fracture uh, in terms of lived experience, in terms of what future means, what life means, what place means, what trust means, um, what society is for, and whether there's a social contract that's being honored um, is um, not going to be helpful <laughs> to build the sorts of social capital and, and what I was arguing at the outset, the kind of collective capacity to act and work through these issues um, that we need. And so all of these burdens, all of these morbidity is not just about individuals needing care, which it is, but it's, all about, it's also about uh, main, maintaining a social um, integrity, a social fabric that we need to lean on to survive and to do the groundwork of, of, um, uh, of all the things that we talk about at a high policy level. Uh, we have to go green. We have to change how we use electricity. We, all of those things are local things, get brokered local, the culture change happens local, the shift to solar panels happens local, and we need civic muscle and collective action to do those things. And this is where um, the, um, 
you know, the issues of mental health um, break out of just being a massive need of care to a massive need of social repair and resilience. Um, and there have been recent reports, uh, I recommend these three, um, that are uh, starting to consolidate the evidence and the argument that goes through all of these layers, starting from what we know best, the individual in injury, illness, morbidity, that then projects that, whoa, what happens when that goes to scale? And then it's not just about that, it's about this, this kind of social confidence, social um, existential um, blow uh, that is also having its own uh, impairing effect. And so it becomes not just about the challenge of the mental health community, not just about do we build a system that cares for people, it's do we build a system that helps prepare um, and give muscle to, um, to our collective ability to solve problems um, because it's gonna increasingly fall on that social climate to do both, to promote well-being while enabling collective action. Um, so that brings us to um, communities. Now, we're no stranger to expanding to that other level of how do we build, um, uh, how does health things, mental health things, uh, physical health things, um, contribute to a larger conversation about how do we build better um, communities? How do we build well-being foundations for, um, uh, for, our, for our communities? And um, you know, the field of social determinants of mental health I mentioned um, really starts to um, make these connections between these where we've really sat as a mental health community and these individual factors and impacts to these larger issues. Of, this, of, of schools and work settings and early child development uh, um, places and our, the, our community built environments and social environments. Um, so we have the policy area of social uh, sustainable development goals, which have challenged all of health. Here's a, a, a diagram from Lancet Psychiatry, an effort to map out for mental health, um, where the issues of individual outcomes um, have social factors that drive them, proximal social factors that drive them, um, that speak to even bigger um, social policy areas like, I'm sorry, like economic development and about um, building cultural um, uh, institutions and macroeconomic policy that, that, that thinks about equity and income stability and all those sorts of things that then realizes um, uh, connects up to these big, broad, ambitious sustainable development goals, which is really kind of a roadmap for how much of our infrastructure as well as our society has changed to live in sustainable ways um, in, in, the, in the future. So there is no, there, there isn't a lack of stabs of intellectual frameworks of, of, of data, of, of partners to work with, of international infrastructures to act on connecting these dots between the role of, of mental health, of what in this diagram is sort of referred to as the social found of the con contribution of mental health to um, what is here and, and emo mental health, emotional resilience, et cetera, it's, con it's contributions to the social foundations of society um, that are uh, necessary um, uh, aims and considerations in economic policy. This is a diagram from uh, that characterizes this idea of donut economics, uh, which is a growing paradigm in the field of development and sustainable economics that says, look, our economic system can't just be about endless growth. It has to be about building a social foundation. Is it doing that? But building a social foundation, which is based on all these things, um, you know, obviously water, food, but also health, education, um, equitable income and work, access, political voice, et cetera, that's a social foundation, but that our building of the social foundation doesn't exceed its ecological ceiling with the reds showing all the ways we are currently um, looking at economic growth in ways that are exceeding our ecological ceilings. So even ec economists are talking about well-being and these foundational issues of social emotional resilience as a key glue, a key limit setting um, construct and set of aims to keep us within this donut of sustainable social and 
natural ecological health. So for the mental health community, it's what we are, what we can contribute is one to stop thinking the way we've been thinking, which is in the lower left-hand corner here of just having sick people wait to come to us and start thinking about the psychological resources that our populations have, not just their mental health, but to think of our work as promoting psychological resources of building them through all those dots of really deeply, widely spreading and norming the psychological resources that people need to cope and to act in the challenges um, ahead. So getting back you know, to this sort of, sort of state. And we have a whole bunch of huge institutions that bring nation states and national leaders together and thousands of scientists together to work on this side of the equation. But we have really nothing like that coming together to bring the sciences, the, the weights of government, the, the inventiveness of international action and deliberation and agreement and aim setting to this side of the equation. And we really have to build that. Um, and, I, and we mental health, public health, mental health minded folks who think are thinking about in this expansive way uh, of, of mental health's contribution to social health and well-being and strong societies to be able to act collectively and show that kind of resilience. We have to start building these structures quickly. There are some rudiments of it. Um, the um, Paris Accords uh, identified nations to plan what they called action for climate empowerment, ACE plans, um, that start to, how are you involving civic society? How are you um, building on your social climate, on your civic strength? There's a, there's a lot of groundwork going on globally um, by grassroots organizations doing that, but we need, but they're underpowered and they need to be supersized and they need more partners um, to do the work with. And that includes the health and mental health systems, our universities, our other social support systems um, to join, to empower them to be those front lines of the social climate um, uh, that they are. And so finally, I would say the last work then of, of for us to put on our agenda, on the mental health and climate agenda, is to not just be part of a system that can reach lots of people uh, who are suffering, a system that can help build more well-being and collectively efficacious societies, but to be part of changing the underlying norms to make that, that those ways of thinking possible. Because to think of the main project, what, what climate change is forcing us to, to face and to do is, is that the, 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 the main project of society is to nurture. And we have lost our way in that. Um, and that's a norm change of massive proportions to enable and fuel and supersize all the sorts of things um, that I've been talking about. The, um, uh, Ruth Shem and Mike Compton, who wrote the book on social determinants of mental health, uh, were talking about, yeah, it takes policies, you know, to change social policies. But what, what we really also, also need is to change social norms. This is a two-page paper that mentions social norms twice. And they're not talking about, you know, habits, customs. They're talking about racism. They're talking about exclusion. They're talking about an inequality of social norms that have to change if we're going to be nurturing societies, we're going to really invest in and seriously grow the social infrastructures that build the social climate. We mental health folks have a lot to bring to that. Work like um, Tony Biglin and Prevention Science, where in this very accessible book and this paper um, have brought together a, a massive amount of evidence that shows what we need to do in schools and in criminal justice systems um, and in the ways we parent and the way we support parents and in the way we design our workplaces and other, that make them mental health promoting, nurturing, pro-social, mutual, mutual um, associating, growing places. And that's what we need. If we're gonna be, again, shepherds of a regenerative, mutually facing earth, uh, we need that, we need uh, a, a nurturing place of, of, uh, of our planet, of our natural systems, then, then we have to make that true of our social systems. Work like Tony's shows that we know a lot how to do that, but the norm change to get there um, is huge. 
um, uh, some books that I would recommend that really start to expand how to think about that, how to reimagine the psychological work, the social psychological work, to realize one, just how far um, we've let our societies create the conditions of uncaring, the way Sally Wantrobe uh, on the left, the psychoanalysis described it, the, the structures of uncaring are so strong that how do we get to right size um, our great instincts and motivations for um, the conditions for caring as the norm, as the new norm. Um, uh, Joanna Macy, who um, uh, many of you may be familiar with, uh, also talks about how do we get to that reimagined place by taking ourselves as part of nature more seriously um, and, and so on. And so I'll just end there with, with my own personal um, version of seeing oneself as part of nature as actually um, not just a way to relax, uh, which is where I started in COVID. I read somewhere, if you want to relax, you know, reduce anxiety during COVID, um, there are all these websites giving advi pop advice for that. Uh, the advice I, I that uh, one advice I read was to watch birds. And so I did that and I got to tell you, it was very effective. Um, and part of it for me was, it, you know, there's this kind of meditation on it and so forth. And a lot of people talk about, you know, green psychology and sort of eco, um, uh, eco therapies and stuff in terms of that kind of meditative quality. I found it value to me as a little more, uh, I don't know, intellectual and pragmatic, which is, um, although it ended up, ended up being very emotional, which was that it made it clear to me that I, we are on this planet, that this planet is so much more alive than we incorporate into our everyday awareness. And, you know, there's this book, Finding the Mother Tree, which talks about the degree that forests are constantly communicating across perhaps miles um, through root systems and fungal systems and different species of, of underground and plant life that are, trading signals and nutrients that adjust for changes in water content and air temperature. And, and that the, the world is wired in a nurturing way that is why there is this abundance of life and why there are us. Uh, we have very few skills to uh, survive in nature other than through our social cooperation and our cultural transmission of knowledge, our communication. Um, but that basis of communication lives throughout the natural world. And my takeaway from all of that was um, to many people that's psychologically healing because it puts, you know, puts things in their perspective and, and so forth. And, I, and I, I think that's wonderful. For me, it did something different, which is it, as a mental health provider, as a psychiatrist, as somebody whose purpose is, is to amplify the quality of emoting and communicating and sharing as the foundations of life and health uh, and purpose, um, to see that actually all of uh, nature is not only wired that way, but we are literally the genetic inheritors of that in ways that go deep in terms of very fundamental chemical mechanisms, uh, billions of years. Um, so these are our cousins, this is, these are our relatives. Um, these are our life support systems. And so the sense of grief at loss and the sense of responsibility in stewardship um, to me uh, is, was game changing to my life. And I think uh, is, some, is emphasizing that idea of what we do in, as mental health in terms of try to improve society through improving the socio-emotional quality and, 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 and rigor and presence um, is actually the Earth's project. And we have a lot to say about it. We should be brave and bold about it. We are the caretakers, not just of um, people with mental illness. We are part of a, a lot to say about being caretakers of uh, the Earth. And so with that, I'll, um, I'll stop for now and, and happy to hear uh, reactions and questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Gary, for uh, the very energizing and inspiring talk. Uh, you elucidated for us so clearly the connections between social climate, between climate change, and also between what's needed to actually to, to ensure the continuity of planet Earth. And, and, and those are very, very big and important messages for us all. Um, <clears throat> I want to thank you for, for the passion with which you communicated your delivery with the urgency with which you are impressing on us and for taking the time really to, to communicate some very, very important messages that extend beyond uh, psychiatry to the very purpose of our being and to importance of changing social norms, um, particularly around uh, the importance of being a more nurturing society. Um, it's easy to get lost in research, it's easy to get lost in policy, and it's rare to find somebody who comes along with a background in research and policy and of doing lots and lots of practical work on the ground to come and remind us that the really important thing is to continue to, to nurture and to continue nurturing and to enable others to nurture at scale, at scale, across sectors, across organizations and at different levels. Thank you so very much for that. We have uh, with us a very select panel of speakers uh, and um, they have been uh, chosen because they all have something very important to contribute uh, to this dialogue. Um, so uh, the, uh, first of all, on the panel, and I would invite uh, the panel, members of the panel now to please unmute and uh, make themselves seen. Yes, then we can all see you. Yeah. All of you, please. Okay, so we have um, Sarah Rankin, who's a storyteller from the Storytelling Center, and, she, um, and Colin White as well, her colleague. Uh, we have with us Erica Sandlin and Bailey Duncan from Ross Hall Academy. And we have uh, Martin Kalshaw, who's Deputy, uh, Deputy Me uh, Medical Director for Mental Health and Addictions at NHS Greater Glasgow and Blind. And Fiona Moss, Head of Health Improvement and Equalities at Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership and Chair of the Flourishing, uh, Flourish Glasgow Partnership. So I think the first questions, I think Sarah will uh, help introduce uh, uh, Erica and Bailey. Yes. We've been thinking you. very carefully about their questions and questions that they want to ask Gary. Yeah, thank you very much, Gina. And thank you very much, Gary. That was very interesting. Um, so I'm Sarah Rankin, a storyteller at the Village Storytelling Centre and this is my colleague Colin White. Um, the Village Storytelling Centre has been established in the community of Pollock in Glasgow for 21 years. And we use storytelling as an art form to bring people together, express our stories and therefore improving access to quality arts experiences, increasing quality of life and um, increasing confidence and connection and mental health. We work with all ages, but Colin and I focus on the children and young people. Last year, we were one of the recipients of um, funding from the Glasgow Centre of Population Health to explore the effects of the climate crisis on young people's mental health. Our group of young storytellers, of which Erica and Bailey are part of, um, is a young person-led group, and they chose to explore this topic by creating a film Bailey and Erica have been part of the village and its project since they were eight years old. And we see it as our responsibility to support and amplify their voices and provide quality arts opportunities for them and their community. As a group, they decided to create a film called The Council of the Earth, which funnily enough is inspired by one of the books that Gary mentioned in Coming Back to Life by Joanna Macy and Molly Young Brown. Um, I, I believe um, the link to the film and to our website has been shared in the chat. Um, they use words like scary, responsibility and feeling small to describe their feelings in the face of a climate crisis. It's important we listen to them, it's important we act and it's important to do what we can to protect their mental health and increase resilience. 
And speaking of young people's voices, I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to let Bailey and Erica ask their um, very important questions to Gary. Um, and I believe Bailey is first. Um, so take it away, Bailey. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bailey. And I just like, to ask a question and my question is we made the film about young people's mental health being affected by climate change how can projects like our film help climate change and its impact on people's mental health how uh, um, did you just repeat the question i think i missed a word which was important <laughs> we just made a about young people's mental health being affected right. by climate change how can projects like our film help climate change and its impact on people's mental health? Yeah. So um, uh, I, I, I'd love to you know, tell me just very briefly what the film, um, to have a sense of what the film is about, what it, what it, what it shows. The film was about um, like all the different animals that were being affected okay. by climate change. And it basically started off with all of them talking about what was happening. And then we summit, basically summoned like a human of our choice to then ask them how they felt about it. Yeah. No, I, I think I think projects like that, first of all, um, can, I, can I ask you what, what did making that film, how did that uh, do for you? How did it make you feel to do that, to do that film, to be able to do that work? It made me feel quite, Good because it felt like we were at least like speaking out about it and what was happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are two. Um, uh, am I making that noise? I'm, am I doing something wrong with my mic? Am I the only one hearing a feedback? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, something happened. Okay. Um, <clears throat> No, I think I think you know work like that does two things. One, it, it helps the doer, um, you know, create, mode, build a community, um, which is critical. And so, you know, you know, we need thousands of 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 of, of groups coming together and 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 putting in expressive form what what this is doing to people. I mean, I I talk to friends, and everyone I know is just trying to suppress what they're feeling on this. And I think COP has made it harder because because it looks like you know when you have power saying this isn't you know we don't care about you we're not you know this isn't important enough for us we're not going to do what's needed um, that is uh, an oppression um, and so people need to, places to go to for, for for this and it's part of not just the key part of of um, mental health and sanity but of of community building is often through these kind of emotives. Um, often we get together, you know, community organizations get together for a project that's technical. This has to have the emotive element or it's not being truthful. Thus, why my, 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 my schematic of thinking about the social climate is this virtuous cycle between subjective well being, attention to the emotionality of it and working on that and having that emotional resilience as, a, as an aim, as a goal, as a joint purpose integrated with collective action because it, it has to be i found it's ines inescapable to separate the two action has to surface the emotion and and help people work through it um and so you're doing that in your project and the more projects like that is more opportunities for people to do that um but i would say it also contributes to another thing which is it, to help people you know the sort of last point i was bringing up is um there's so many barriers to doing these things to doing mental health, to doing climate implementation and response, adaptation work, et cetera, locally in different ways. Actually taking into our own hands to do the work, to really invest in civic muscle grassroots power to do the work, not just advocate for the work, but to do it. Um, and that means reimagining, this nurture reimagining. Reimagining us is actually a nurture-based society and what that looks like. And I'm going to, um, I'm sorry, um, I'm gonna screen share. I know I'm going, I don't know if I'm, because uh, you made me think of something that I think is really powerful, which is this quote um, from uh, Adrian Marie Brown, who um, is just a really uh, thoughtful thinker about many things. Oh, I didn't mean to do that.
Um, but she said, um, so she said, we live in a world which other people imagined. So our world, other people imagined it this way, how industry would work, how you know, finance would flow, et cetera. And so most of the contracts that oppress us feel like fact, are taught to us as a fact, but they're actually evidence of historical imagination. These ideas were imagined before being practiced and made solid. And many of those things imagined that make the, our world the way it is were not the most beautiful things imagined in human history, but the most violently upheld. So we are in an imagination battle. And I think a lot of this work of climate change about moving the needle, about really exercising civic muscle is um, both needs to overcome that imagination battle, but is also the thrust of that imagination battle is, is projects like you're doing is this whole notion of collective action um, in propagating in, 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 in mental health folks realizing, I mean, we are the merchants of, of, of imagining, of emoting. Um, and if we all, every one of us sponsored climate cafes and filled their cities with dots like that, of these kinds of um, opportunities for people to imagine with each other, um, that's, that's not a kumbaya moment. That is really a pragmatic, necessary strategy. Thank you. <clears throat> Bailey, would you like to ask, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, Bailey, would you like to ask your question now? Um, at America, um, my question is, oh, it's, it's obvious that children and young people's mental health has been affected by climate change. What should the government do to support children and young people in their schools and communities? So the first thing it should do, and, and your government is doing it, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of the other governments like mine um, uh, that need to be aggressive about climate change. Um, they have to start um, communicating to you that they do care what happens to you. Um, they do have your back. Um, they do want to invest in you. And right now they're communicating, and, it's, and especially to their own citizens, but to youth globally, that they do not. Um, and so that's one thing that, that they have to do. But another thing they need to do is um, invest in all these other things we know that nurture. Um, to understand that it's not just a progressive politics that um, calls for income equity and stability, anti-racism, early childhood richness and resources and early childhood education, um, supporting um, uh, parenting, creating more nurturing environments. That, those aren't just some, you know, uh, this battle going on in our country right now, some progressive left-wing sort of um, goal. Those are survival tools. Um, if we don't have the kind of social fabric I've been, you know, been talking about, the kind of social climate I've been talking about, if we don't have youth um, that feel like uh, they're heard and that they're, they have a, a safe tunnel ahead of them, um, and even if it can't be guaranteed and safe, they have um, the will of society to uh, be with them in this. Um, if that isn't there, then, um, then we're all in trouble in terms of not only getting our act together to do the local work we can, to weather as much and as best as we can, uh, but for your generation um, to, um, feel like it's not staring down um, a dark future, which affects all of society if we have that kind of generational um, harm. Thanks, Gary, it's certainly very true. Uh, that's why it's so important to have young people like Erica and Bailey with us today. And, and uh, thanks very much for uh, sharing your um, experiences, Erica and Bailey. Can I move on now to Martin um, to uh, pose Gary a response and a question? Hi there. Um, Gary, thank you very much for that very interesting and thought-provoking and uh, inspiring talk, uh, as Gina said. And um, 
I was particularly glad to hear what you were saying about watching birds because um, that's been my hobby for all my life and it certainly is uh, something that I would uh, say is a very therapeutic one. I would encourage people to to get in touch with nature as much as possible uh, during these times. But you, much of uh, the rest of what you were saying uh, resonates with me and I'm sure others here today, particularly those who work in mental health. Uh, and for me, particularly in, in two ways. Firstly, the, the growing anticipatory anxiety around the climate crisis, which you alluded to and which we all feel, and which I think is likely to contribute more and more to the both the demand on mental health services, probably to the point of overwhelming them, um, but also to the unseen need, the, the, the people that we, that we don't always see. Um, and you alluded obviously to the, the young people uh, and the, the increasing presentations during COVID. And we've seen that here as well uh, in terms of uh, more and more acute presentations of young people with deliberate self-harm and um, acute presentations of eating disorders. So it's been a worrying time from that point of view. The other thing that, that resonated with me was you, you mentioning the, the novel approaches that we, we need to begin to adopt to, to support people with mental health needs, very much based on building individual and community resilience, a better integration of care, more community ownership, more aligned care to what people actually need. And I'm sure Fiona will come on to explain some of what we're trying to implement uh, in Glasgow to address unmet need and accessibility and better aligned systems and better outcomes for people, in addition to the work we're, we're trying to do on prevention and reducing adverse childhood experiences. But my question, or I've maybe got a couple of questions for you, depending on how much time we have, but my first question was, was a non-clinical one, really. And I was interested to get your thoughts about the what you think about the what's the role of the the news media in climate anxiety. And um, we, you know, when we watch the news these days, um, we, we usually kind of have to get through the the section on COVID, and we think we're out the woods when we when we get at the end of that, and then instead we're bombarded with images of forest fires and flooding, and um, chunks falling off icebergs and things like that going on around the world and I'm just wondering if there's if you feel that's something that can be irresponsible at times whether it can be alarming for people particularly young people to witness or whether it's something that's necessary to create anxiety amongst all of us because ultimately that's what's going to drive change if things are going to get better. Yeah, I think I think there are some outstanding um, news outlets, particularly The Guardian, who has um, really put climate front front and center. Um, this is the most important issue, and it, it's impossible to read The Guardian with without appreciating that they think this is the most important issue. I think that is untrue of almost all other news outlets, um, and. Um, I, and I think that's a huge, you know, I think that's a huge problem. My first direct action, my Extinction Rebellion um, civil disobedience was uh, laying down in front of the New York Times headquarters in New York City on 8th Avenue, which if you know anything about New York is a huge, long avenue. And it's right across the street from the main bus station. So we shut down traffic for a while. Um, the idea was to protest that the news was just not, this was a couple of years ago, it was just not really treating this the, in the earth shattering way that, that, it, that it is. You know, daily, um, you know, reporting, but also uh, the New York, the front, long short of it, the New York Times didn't even report on our demonstration in front of the New York Times. <laughs> um, I think that's changed a bit, uh, but um, I do agree with you. It, it sort of, when you think of, you know, journalism, you know, let's say about some sensational thing, a political event. Good journalism does what? It buries down, right? It asks, where's the money coming from? Whose interests are this about? Um, why are we stalemated here? Why isn't this happening? It's investigative reporting. And I still think a lot of that lacks around um, climate change. It's more, um, you know, it's going on in the US now in this debate in Congress about what would be really the first real climate relevant legislation by the US Congress. Um, and it's kind of been stuck. And most of the, the, the press has been about, you know, it's like a, a sports casting. He said this, she said that, well, he vote this way. Um, not about, you know, you know, why is this single Senator, you know, 
ready to throw the planet under the bus. You know, follow the money, um, but really follow it and um, really, you know, show um, who's getting paid what and, and what it is. And, you know, letting, letting politicians get away with, well, it's going to affect my state's economy when it won't, um, needs to be reported and explored and drilled down on and so forth. And so I just see just not a, a, a lot of good investigative journalism going around. Why is the planet still this way when it is so colossally clear that it should not be this way? Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is, is I think and that you get to is how can they you know, um, help all of us cope and act? Um, and I, I do, I, people have different beliefs about this. I don't know what the data is. My sense is, 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 is truth is valuable. Uh, all truth is valuable. Um, so the more truthful about how bad things are, I think our politicians have not been good truth tellers about just how bad it is um, and are not being held accountable to that. I also, um, and how unprepared we are, um, but um, also, you know, things like that you can't know, like I want to know what is the PPM, you know, the, the levels of, of carbon emissions where I live, where are we, what's, you know, give me some numbers that, 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 that hit in the face exactly where we are. What we do, one thing we do know from environmental psychology is people mostly respond to the climate issue about how it affects where they live. So particularize it, um, really investigate it. Um, those would be my two, please. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Gary. Um, thanks, Gina. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Gary. And yeah, yes. Can uh, can we move on now to Fiona, please? Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. And um, I, I'm aware there's lots of people on this call that we can't see that are also listening to, to all of this discussion. So hello to everybody um, there. Um, I suppose your your talk, Gary, was music to my ears. Uh, working within public health, working in health improvement, um, our uh, our whole um, premise and working is often on a social movement for change for things that quite often people don't feel are a problem now. So in, in that sense, for public health, we have had to work for many, many years trying to um, advocate for change, often sometimes starting with only a few, um, and try and build that momentum over time. So the, the kind of uh, presentation you've given us today about how you build some of that momentum um, working around social and mental health issues in relation to climate has been fantastic to hear. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I suppose I'm thought you thoughtful. You've been talking about social climate. Um, I suppose in Glasgow, um, we've been trying to think about our ecosystem for social well-being and mental health, and really thinking with the city that we're at at the moment. Um, what are the next steps that we can take that really supports uh, people in Glasgow to be mentally well and also to feel that they can affect change in the climate? Because when we feel disempowered and disengaged, we often don't feel we can even change ourselves, never mind changing the world. And I suppose I would just welcome your views on what you think we could do next uh, yeah. to, to try and get some momentum. Um, so I'll, I'll take a stab at that acknowledging that I'm not sure where you're at. So um, if I'm describing next things that you, you know, already did long ago, then tell me. But, um, uh, you, you know, so, so, you know, the social ecosystem, social climate, I mean, these are, these are, these are framings that have emerged, you know, in through the public health and well-being and space that have started to infiltrate, you know, things like well-being budgeting and, and, and so there's, there's starting to get real real traction to this notion and, and specificity and actionability to it. Um, they're all similar, but the one thing that I really insist is part, and it goes back to my, my circle, my, uh, is it's not just the well-being part that there's an end state of people feeling like they're thriving, but, um, uh, but they're co-owners of it, that it's, it's the collective action part um, that I think is particularly imperative in terms of you know, climate change. I mean, I think I mentioned this. If even if if we 
if tomorrow COP you know, could decide and all nations agreed and they were gonna put all the money they had to put into to, you know, decarbonize our electric grids in, in 10 years, five years, ideally 10 years, um, it's still gonna take local change, massive local transitions and how we live and go place to place and what's on our roofs and how we use our land and just, you know, and so, it, it's always going to need this, this local ground game. Um, and that has to have to be just, to be humane, to be accountable, and to feel owned and to be mixed in with this work of, you know, contributing to the social glue has to be through em empowering um, the ground. So, um, you know, so when you say, you know, how do we build, you know, local engagement, local involvement is to Build local engagement, local involvement. Um, the way we did with Thrive, and I think we were just getting started. We were just warming up um, before some of the the political interest in going that in that direction kind of uh, floundered. Um, but I, I got to taste a little bit of what of what that was like, and we did two things at the time. One was we 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 did a lot of these initiatives where where we were able to prove the concept. We had, we were able to show this is what it could look like. Um, uh, so for example, we did partnerships with, um, a whole bunch of behavioral organizations. Those dots include a lot of, you know, community-based organizations that have nothing to do with mental health, nothing to do with even human services. Um, but we partnered them with behavioral providers and we could see grants to the community-based organization. They were in the driver's seat. They identified what they needed, what their distress was, what their issues they wanted to work with. The, the, the partners to them helped them think through what was the right match of skill or method that could help them get there. So it was, it was really trying to shift um, uh, the, the decision-making and ideating and, and problem-solving and implementing work um, to the ground. Um, and that we, we need to do, you know, uh, we need to really double, triple, quadruple down on that sort of thing with the sort of challenges we're facing, not just from doing climate mitigation and adaptation work, but for the emotional resilience that it's gonna to take to do that work. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. I have a question of my own. You speak a lot about shifting social norms and uh, I just, I mean, that's of course, that's an enormous challenge shifting social norms. And I'm wondering what I was trying to think about was where, 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 if I would be easiest to bring about, you know, to, to shift norms, um, where have you found that it's easiest to shift norms? I have some answers on my own, but I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to hear what you think. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing is, um, is to start where people are at again, you know, um, where they are seeing a problem that is, um, receptive to um, uh, to thinking outside of the box, to really reconnecting on things. So, um, you know, I found like when I work with mental health and I in doing some of the projects like what we did with Thrive. First of all, we called it Thrive and call it the Mental Health Plan for New York City. Um, like you know, flourishing Glasgow. You know, you, you want to talk to something that people people want you know, to explain. They want to thrive. Okay, so. Um, and we need to, and we as mental health folks have to see ourselves more as means to other people's ends, not as the end, in the, not as the end in ourself. We're going to stamp out depression. No, we're going to improve graduation rates. Um, we we have something that can help you be more effective in in coping and acting on climate change. This, you know, because we have that, but we're not built to talk that way or act that way. Um, so, is to bring this the skills we have. Um, to help people reimagine to the things they're ready to, you know, to where they're, to, to their point of readiness. Um, but I will also completely confess that um, there are whole other um, disciplines and areas and sciences and local traditions that are much more thoughtful about how you get groups of people to new imaginaries than I am. And um, the, the sort of ensemble of, of partners and thinkers to build the social climate is much larger than mental health folks. I think we have a unique and critical and under tapped and under appreciated by the mental health field contribution to that. Um, but, but by far it is, it is a team game.
to build that. And so I'm really fascinated by the whole array of social sciences, um, um, arts, um, that have really gotten sophisticated about how to bring people to new imaginaries. And so I'm, I'm actually working with, with a whole bunch of what I'm calling the human sciences, um, uh, leaderships and societies in the US to think, and we're, we're planning what I hope will come together as kind of a, a summit meeting about how do this human sciences advance the social climate? Um, because within there are a lot of intelligence about how you build social movements, how you maintain, how you, how you motivate people to, uh, to do this, how, how to connect to issues that may not directly address them, but are, are require them to be uh, de-self-centered and, and, and focus on values of, of norms of mutuality and, and, next, you know, and, and stewardship and so forth. There's a lot of other thinking and, and empirical experience in doing that. And so we, we mental health folks, I think are, are uh, point people, but not, but in part convening others to create a new social climate science. Hmm. Well, thanks for that. I think Martin, you had another question for Gary. Yeah, thanks, Gina. Um, yes, I had a, a much more specific question and uh, I suppose a clinical question, which is maybe why I'm on the panel and which I should have asked the first time. But really, really, it was, it was your slide that mentioned um, serious mental illness or major mental illness. And I, I just wondered if, if as a psychiatrist, you had seen that that was, is that a group that we have to think about differently? A, lo a lot of what we're doing in Glasgow is about trying to manage distress and stress and um, perhaps less severe mental health problems without in any way minimizing them. Um, but but that, that side of things, whereas the core of our service is very much already geared around supporting people with schizophrenia, with bipolar illness, with, with, with other uh, severe and enduring mental illness, I just wondered what your maybe what your predictions were for that group going forward in terms of the the climate crisis and whether whether there's other things that we need to think about whether they are particularly vulnerable here uh, in addition to to other people who maybe otherwise um you, you know would be less likely to, to come across needing mental health care yeah i mean part of the notion of respatializing the work of thinking about bigger structural issues and systems of you know, how do we build a nurturing society um, in terms of building in all these other places, uh, ways that are promotive of that um, is because we can't go after, I, I think our politics has sort of gone after one vulnerability at a time, right? There's a constituency with the vulnerable this, the vulnerable that. We have marginalized our economic system, our, um, particularly in, in the US, our legacy of, of struggle, structural racism in many of our systems, we, our class biases, our classisms, um, uh, and, and growing income, income uh, inequities are, are just an engine for vulnerability creations. And, um, and so we, we have multiple crises that should have woken up us up to this, but the climate crisis especially, um, we, we can't, we need to think of the whole shift um, of every, of all of our social spaces being nurturing ones and our politics being in the service of that. You know, how do we get to that? So the mental health field in prevention, developmental, et cetera, psychology and mental health prevention know a lot about that, as do a lot of other, a lot of other disciplines. And so how, putting that knowledge to work um, we can do, but we, can, we also have to make part of the climate conversation um, be about the social climate. Now with, with this attention, you know, my, my slide where there are so many ways to assemble and bring uh, the force of focus of the leading decision makers globally around the Earth's climate. We need to also do that. We may have to start locally in our local systems, um, bring that to attention to the social climate. So all of us with expertise and stake and as practitioners and knowledge bearers and executors of the infrastructure for a social climate, like the mental health professional, public health professionals, need to stand, stand up and see that that is part of their purpose here on the planet now, is, is to build that constituency and that, and that change. Well, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, yes. Would anybody like to ask Gary a final question? 
if yeah. I could just come in and it's not it's not a question, Gary, it's more picking up on the work that Erica and Bailey have done and just thinking about your Billion Minds Institute. And wouldn't it be lovely to see you be able to tweet that video and just get it out there to contribute to part of the climate change? Because it's our you. groundswell in Glasgow and it no, would be great to see that used across the do. world. Thank I will you. Do, and I copied the link, so I've, I've got it. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're coming to the end of the time. I hope, Gary, that you will be able to make it to Glasgow in person. Yes, uh, yes and, and just to tempt you, we've got some wonderful bird sanctuaries. Uh <laughs> no, I, I can name a single bird. <laughs> it's, it's purely the realizing that, you know, there's intelligences around it that we're also responsible, not just our own. So let's show responsibility. Great, great message to end on. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you very much also to our panel for posing great questions, uh, for the brilliant opportunity to showcase the film that Erica and Bailey and others were involved in. Thanks everyone uh, for contributing to this very, very important discussion. And finally, of course, thank you so much to the Glasgow Center for Population Health for organizing this seminar at a very timely moment. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it.